if you're, let's assume, I don't know you guys, but assuming you are householders, put yourself in the position, if you are having to spend 20% of your annual salary every year on just repairing your house, probably you'll come to the conclusion that it'd be better to do something about the house um, so you weren't having to spend 20% of your salary on repairs. Five cents on hurricane straps. Five cents on hurricane straps, for example. So I think that's the kind of, you know, if you bring it down just to a very concrete level, and ultimately it's the same issue, whether it's a household or a house, or a government running a country, um, you start seeing, you know, why it gets to the point where governments are now saying, hold on, we cannot go on like this. This is, a, this, this is something we actually have to do something about. Paradoxically, the tighter the economic situation becomes, the more they have to do something about it. If you've actually got billions of dollars in reserves and lots of money to splash around, then, okay, loss of life apart, you can probably let your schools and hospitals and things fall down and you can just rebuild them because it doesn't, you have the money to do so. But the tighter... The, the economic situation gets when, in a sense, you're less able to afford to lose things. Um, and I think the same happens, again, if you go down to the individual level, to the household level. In poor households, people tend to be extremely careful about how they look after their possessions because they can't actually afford to lose any of them. It was Tropical Storm Tomas, so we hadn't even gotten to a Category 1 hurricane, much less what would have been the impact of a Category 4, Category 5. And we do have um, housing infrastructure across Barbados that is critically at risk, uh, particularly in face of a very, very, you know, a Category 3, 4, 5 hurricane. It is important that as individuals we also take responsibility uh, for reducing risk at our personal level and also at community level. But in order to do that, it means that we have to raise the understanding levels of people um, and that people, just like government, have to make choices about what works best for them. Now, just as with governments, those choices are not easy choices. Uh, we had quite a discussion during the, the session today about what do you do if you know, you've inherited a piece of land um, you know, passed down in the family, you've now gotten it, but it sits in a floodplain, but that's the only asset you have, and you need a place to construct your home. Do you say, well, this is not zoned for construction, I can't build my house here, or depending on your economic situation, you make, you know, these choices that sometimes are not the right choices. And I think what we need to ensure is that there is deep understanding um, for all of us living in small islands, about the types of hazards we face, how we can protect ourselves and minimize risk beyond preparedness. Um, we all know how to get our cans, canned goods and our biscuits, etc. when hurricane season hits. We all march down to Big B's, you know, end of May, early June. But we need to step back. We need to look at the minimal cost in putting hurricane straps in our roofs to the point of re-roofing or rebuilding. We need to think about: Are we building on this slope, or you know, or in this in this floodplain? And we need to follow our bi building codes, because when the government um, does zone something as not for a certain kind of uh, construction, um, that needs to be followed. Uh, we need to ensure that our laws on the books are enforced. We wouldn't want that translated to cost in life. That's really where the choice comes in. Do I build something that's actually going to resist the next hurricane? Is it going to resist the next earthquake? Is it going to resist the next flood? Is it sited in the right place? Or am I just going to do what up to now has been business as usual and not take those risks into account? What the report tells us is that actually if we do take the risks into account, then the benefits we're going to gain um, far exceed the costs we're going to incur. So let's just say, let's take an example. Just say I have to build a school, and the basic cost of the school is 100,000 US dollars. Say I'm in a seismic zone, I'm, I'm also in a hurricane exposed area, so to make this earthquake proof, and to make it hurricane proof, maybe instead of investing 100,000, 
I have to invest 120,000. So initially that sounds like bad news for the government. I mean, I suddenly have to find an extra 20% in my budget to make this school safe. But if I then look at what I'm going to avoid having to spend in terms of repairs, rebuilding, remodeling, every time this thing is damaged in a disaster over the life of that school is supposed to serve, um, then I'm going to find that the what I'm actually saving is around four times more than I'm actually spending. So it's actually really good business if you're actually thinking about conserving my scarce, scarce public resources and really investing it in development, it sounds like quite a good business case. And I think that's just a crude economic case because if we also take into account that by doing that, I might also be you know, saving lives of school children in the school, or I might be saving lives of patients in the hospital, or I might be preserving critical facilities like schools or community centers which also serve as refuges during a disaster, then the business case kind of gets better and better and better.